I've done my best today to try to review all the comments of all the major YouTube channels of everything that I could find on Twitter, of everything I could find in the press, everything that I could find on CNBC, and et cetera, and et cetera, et cetera, to see what folks are talking about with regard to this huge beat by Tesla today. Well, actually, what's more interesting than that is what they're not talking about. So I'll talk about that, and I'll talk about the financial news that will impact stocks this week, like I typically do on Sunday night on my program I call Monday Morning. And I'll give you my estimate of, at the very end, I'll give you my estimate of where Tesla will be in the shortened and light trading day tomorrow, and also where they'll be for the week. Anyway, <laughs> if, uh, uh, if you haven't viewed it yet, I certainly recommend that you take a look at the uh, video I did earlier today. Um, and actually, the one from Brian this morning as well. The one for, with Brian this morning was about the Model 3 Highland um, and about the potential that maybe people aren't paying attention to that might really increase total sales, total profits. Um, and also the one I did a few hours ago uh, on, uh, on the beat which I went into the details of what that impact really does mean that the, nobody's reporting about. And uh, that one uh, is now probably going to be the most viewed video that's ever been on the channel in the seven months that I've been doing this. So anyway, the card above, if you want to check that out. All right. Okay. The analyst. Oh, uh, yeah. This is Randy Kirk. <laughs> yeah. By the way, this is Randy Kirk. And if you like my Sunday night program where I talk about the week in it, you know, that's coming up. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, hit notify. I've got three programs I'm planning. I've got interviews coming this week. I've got major, major breaking stuff that I'm working on right now that is very unique and that you're not going to find anyplace else. So if you want to see this stuff, you want to hit notify, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, uh, buy the book and be part of Patreon to help support the channel. All right. Um, what is the what are the analysts failing to talk about with regard to the beat? Well, first of all, it shows that Shanghai is capable of hitting consistently 250,000 per quarter. And we know that they've actually done a run rate of more than that in the past. So I'm only going to figure them for 250,000 in quarter three and quarter four, but also at least that. So those could be higher than expected. The same thing about Fremont second verse. Fremont is at 150,000. Uh, they're probably not quite there yet, but I am anticipating they'll up at just a little bit more and they will hit 150,000 both quarters, probably 150,000 and could be more, but not less. Then you go to Austin. They should be at least at 6,000 per week in quarter three and over 9,000 per week in quarter four. They should be really hitting their full on run rate for you know the uh, uh, for the planned first phase, um, and also same thing for uh, Berlin. So that would give them eighty thousand and one hundred twenty five thousand respect respectively in the third and fourth quarter, um, and that will uh, you know give us a total of two point one million for the year. So in other words, what nobody's reporting on is that the one point eight million is off the table. Two million is like a walk in the park. It's going to be easy. We're already at a 2 million run rate and it's just going to keep increasing. And my 2.3 million that I've been talking about, you know, a year ago, yeah, that's probably not going to happen, although it could. And how could it happen? Well, it could happen if in fact, Fremont could get their numbers up uh, to uh, a 160 uh, instead of, uh, instead of uh, 150. Uh, if Shanghai could get up to one a run rate of 1.1 million instead of uh, just 1 million. Uh, if uh, if uh, the uh, ramps on the two other products are just a little faster than we think in Austin and in, in Berlin. Um, anyway, but I'm going to stick with 2.1. That's my number for this year. And of course, that means what? Well, that means, and oh, I'm also projecting that the inventory in transit will drop, not continue to increase like it has been. 16 million, 18 million, you know, is not going to continue to do that. It will actually drop in the next two quarters. That will help us get to the 2.1 million. Well, okay. So then if they keep on selling out, that means less pressure on price. So that will increase margins on the price side. And then the, we also know there'll be less, uh, uh, there'll be greater margins coming from the cost of goods side because 
of the lower, all the things we've talked about, the lowering of commodity prices, the, uh, the increase on the ramp, uh, reducing the cost of goods sold because of the ramp going up and also the overhead contribution will go down. So all of those things are going to give us a much bigger number in uh, this year. I'm thinking now close to $6 a share in profit. Uh, you can pick that number or like that number, not like that number. That's where I think we're headed. So um, in addition to that, uh, we are going to see, just, I'm sorry, just a second. I'm doing something to eliminate some noises that might bother you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So taking nothing away from what other YouTubers or other Twitter folks who do detailed analysis of shipments and production, how did I end up winning the day? I know I'm the Uber bull and I, I was way too high. Well, I pay attention to all of them. I like them. I watch them. But my numbers were the best, and I don't do nearly the amount of detail. Why is this? I merely look at production capacity and still make the assumption that they will sell what they make. Inventory and transit is going to bounce all around, and anybody that thinks they can predict that total, more power to them. I just think that right now, having uh, you know this many, uh, 90 million, 100 million, maybe more than that in transit is high and it won't need to go any higher. So that'll start coming down, but that's a, that's a guess. So um, more power to those guys if they wanna try to nitpick and figure all this up, it just doesn't matter. Take the production, it's the easiest thing to do. That's the thing we have the most data about. We can project and predict the data, the data about production the easiest. Even that's filled with potential surprises. I think the mo I thought the Model Y would be ahead in both locations of where it is now in terms of the ramp, but it is knowable within reason. And look at how far off all these other folks were. Some of them were off by lots and lots and lots. Well, speaking of days of inventory, quarter one is still at uh, was at 15 days of inventory. That increases to 16 days in quarter two. All of that is coming from Model S and Model X. I do expect this to go down, not necessarily the number of days, but the total units outstanding in inventory to drop, which I guess will end up probably with a decrease in days. All right, let's switch, switch to the financial news that's coming up this week. Um, pretty much everything anybody's going to care about this week is jobs. We have the ADP reporting on uh, job increases on Wednesday. Then we have the U.S. government numbers on Friday. We will also get the job openings number on Thursday. When you combine those three, you'll get a pretty good read on where the economy is going. And it's my current opinion that the market has switched gears and is more interested in economic progress with just a sideways glance to see if inflation is still headed down. Hopefully the Fed is going to start thinking that way too. We will get the Fed minutes on Wednesday, speaking of the Fed, but those are are having almost no impact anymore because the Fed chairman and the governors and the presidents and whatever they are of all the regions, they're on TV all the time talking about what went on in the last meeting anyway, so the Fed minutes probably won't have any effect. What is predicted is that the job numbers are expected to be flat, about the same as last, uh, last month. Um, still 10 million job openings but only 1.1 million long-term unemployed. So that nine to one ratio will probably continue. Nine jobs waiting for the 1.1 million unemployed on a long-term basis. About 6 million total unemployed, but you know, if those are 5 million of that six are in transition, you're always gonna have those people that just recently got laid off or just recently um, <clears throat> got laid off, quote unquote. Anyway, <laughs> Are they are they quit? Hourly wages are expected to come in at about 3% month over month and 4% year over year. And that is more than the Fed wants, but I don't think they're going to be worried about that. Um, they want it to be about a, a point lower than that. They'd like to see 3% on the employment gains in terms of wages. If the employment numbers miss by a lot, there could be some real market unhappiness or some real market happiness but it would be transitory. I don't think it's going to be the big thing. Um, if it misses, if we get a really big number in terms of the number of people employed, 
I think that you could see a bounce in the market. I don't think they're going to worry that that's going to destroy the Fed's decision-making process and cause them to raise rates because of one month of higher uh, employment numbers. And if they're lower than expected, I don't think that's going to destroy the market long-term because they're not going to take one month data like that and have it be what's critical. All right. Also coming this week, you have several reports on goods and services trends, the the uh, purchasing agents, uh, what, their set, what their opinion is about how things are looking. I don't think any of that is going to have much of an effect unless it's really outside of what the expectations are. Um, oil is flattish um, at around 70. Bond yields are in the after hours tonight um, or the pre-hours, what do you want to call them? Uh, bond yields are headed up again, uh, but it's still right in the middle of, of, uh, of the, the range. I'm not going to be too worried about bonds unless the 10-year passes four or the two-year passes five. Uh, what would really be interesting is if those two start to uninvert. They continue to be inverted. And I'm curious to see what Kathy Wood says about this coming up this Friday in her report, because this is the beginning of year two of this massive inversion between the 10-year and the two-year and also the 10-year and the two-month. Um, it continues to be about a point on the two month and about a point and a half on the, on, uh, I'm sorry, about a point on the two year and about a point and a half on the two month. But I don't think that this is uh, any kind of indication of a future recession at this point. I think it is a kind of a new situation. It's an anomaly that we haven't seen before that has to do with all of this big money that came into the marketplace two years ago with COVID and then all of the confusion in terms of supply chains. And I think it will work its way out over time. I don't think there's anything to worry about there. Uh, by the way, I did check on uh, Trueflation and Trueflation has now dropped below 2.3 for the first time to 2.29. Um, that's getting really, really close to 2% and it's just headed straight down. I think we're in real danger of the Fed overstepping at this point and over hitting, over going past their targets, being down to 0% inflation, maybe even going into a deflation. Um, uh, and, and this would be very bad news for them. This is not what they want. And so that would cause, <laughs> once again, they would be late to the party and they would have to immediately start dropping rates. No, this is not what we wanna see. We don't wanna see the Fed showing up late and then overreacting. All right. Well, the Tesla huge beat, that's also likely to help the overall market. It, it give it a little more spring in its step. Most analysts would like to see the market broaden out a little bit, not just be all about the magnificent seven or eight, of which Tesla is one of those seven. Um, if the employment numbers are good this week, I think maybe we'll start to see that broadening out. Um, there is a lot of cash on the sidelines, tons of cash on the sidelines, and nobody wants to miss the next leg up on this bull market. So, uh, yes, I think we'll start to see people who are traditionally more likely to buy uh, Dow stocks or more likely to buy, um, you know, food stocks or more likely to buy oil stocks. I think we'll start to see those people coming into the market and buying, uh, buying in a more broad fashion. All right, so what's gonna happen this week with Tesla? All right, tomorrow morning on this shortened day, not only short, but also there's gonna be a whole lot of people that aren't gonna be playing. I think Tesla's gonna open around 275, the recent high. Not higher than that, maybe a little lower than that, but around 275, I think that's where it'll open in the morning. But I expect there'll be a quick sell-off with some profit taking. And remember, when there's uh, somebody argued with me in the comments, uh, my real feeling is that when you have a stock like Tesla that already has wild swings and you don't have many people playing, you can have wilder swings. <laughs> OK, so and then you have these this big beat. I mean, there's an awful lot going on tomorrow, it, but it's going to it's going to take tomorrow and it's not going to like go past 275 to 300 tomorrow. I don't think that's going to happen. I think 275 to 280 will be the high tomorrow. I don't know if it'll close on the high, but it probably will. Anyway, those are that's my speculation. I'm not an investment advisor. This is not investment advice. It's just kind of where I'm seeing it, both from fundamentals and technicals. I see Tesla going to 275 right off the bat, maybe backing off to 270, 269, 268 going back up to 275, maybe playing around a lot, and then maybe drifting a little higher than 275 towards 280, 
and then maybe closing on the high. That would be like a perfect, that'd be a, a, a Cinderella story there. And then uh, what do I see for the rest of the week? I see Tesla going on to 300, assuming a normal market, assuming there's no big surprises for Tesla or for the market. I think we go on to 300 by the end of the week, but not higher. 300 is going to be the new, that's going to be the new high. Oh, there's a 305 technical level. It might go to 305, but it'll, not, it'll get into a trading range now that'll last until July 19th, which is when the earnings report comes out. And everybody's going to be interested to see what those margins were. Um, and then any other kind of reporting that we're going to get on that day, which could be immense. We've talked about that in other shows. Uh, so once again, um, uh, 300 by the end of the week, and then a trading range, 275 to 305 uh, for the next couple of weeks, unless there might be nibbles of information or expectations about what might happen on the earnings report, then you could start to see maybe a drift over 300 as we get closer to July 19th. All right. Uh, remember to take an uh, go back and take a look at my detailed analysis of today's numbers and what that will mean for earnings for the rest of 2023. The card above, or you can look back down in the description for that information and also look for the uh, for the URL down below on the, the great conversation that I had with uh, Brian White this morning about the Model 3. Um, and uh, so hit, hit the like, hit subscribe, hit notify, buy a book and join Patreon. And that's all I've got for you on this beautiful Sunday night.